Hello, everybody. Uh, it's Scott Bischoff recording for Detroit Lions podcast. Yes, the Lions lost wa- last week, and um, there were flickers of hope. Uh, so we're going to try to talk about the upcoming matchup this week at home against the Miami Dolphins. Um, we're not going to try to be so... Uh, unhappy and, uh, and upset, and uh, we're going to try to make this fun, and because uh, that's really all we can control is our outlook and our attitude about how these things are going. So stay with us. Uh, preview's coming at you right now. Okay, so just a little bit about last week. Yes, um, it sucked. (laughs) It really did. It sucked. Uh, Going into the half, it was really interesting to to see the Lions hold Dallas. Um, Dallas did look like I thought they would look. They did look a little bit out of sorts with Dak Prescott. And just uh, overall... um, I thought the Lions' defense played really good in the first half. And then, uh, you know, the whole the Jared Goff issue, and it's an issue, and it's something we talked about from the first video I did. Uh, it'll be something we continue to talk about. Um, there are some trends that are that are popping up that we'll get into, uh, but they, they definitely showed. Uh, I thought Josh Pascal played fantastic in the first half. And did things uh, already in game one that were both impressive and eye-opening. Uh, I do love that they played Pascal as the closed end and asked him to take on the double teams and to deal with all of the the bodies and all that stuff while moving Hutchinson to the open side um, and in some ways playing him the way I I hoped. Uh, I mean, there was some three-point stance, some two-point stance, whatever. It, you know, it's just it's more it's more conducive to him winning his individual matchups, and them doing everything they can to get him going by playing him in in a position that makes him you know gives him the best opportunity to play at his premium, if that makes any sense. That's, that was a lot of peas. Um, okay, so um, we're past. We're. Uh, I'm going to tell everybody what I tell our offensive line. Uh, we can't control anything that's happened in the past, and we can't look too far into the future. The only thing we can really talk about is what's happening right now and what's right in front of us. And I know that sounds stupid and ridiculous for what we're doing here, but I told you that this was going to be a little, um, a little more on the fun side of, uh, you know, matchups and that kind of stuff. So it's not such a depressing down in the dumps uh shit show kind of so to speak so to the numbers here we go miami is a three-point favorite uh the game total vegas has at 50 and a half they have miami uh miami's implied number is 26 and three quarters detroit is 23 and three quarters so they're expecting a bit of a high scoring game which if you look at these two defenses yeah you could see that happening uh as an aside if you want to be super cute and uh, go against the grain. A nice uh, GPP kind of DraftKings FanDuel lineup would start with a player like Jared Goff and maybe um, stacked with uh, Josh Reynolds and uh, running, it, running it back with Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell. I just don't, I'm not sure how the Lions stop those two guys this week. And uh, from a pace standpoint, it just seems like Goff and the Lions offense are going to have to really keep the foot on the, on the gas this week. So just, you know, throwing it out there. Okay, so here are the numbers. Um, on offense, the Detroit Lions are the number four rush offense in the NFL, 5.3 yards per carry. Miami's number 25 at 3.9 yards per carry. Detroit is tied for ninth with seven total rushing touchdowns. Miami is tied for 23rd with four total rushing touchdowns. 
Uh, I want to say the Lions have played one less game than Miami, so there you, there's a little more there too. Um, passing offense. Detroit is tied for 11th with 7.5 yards per attempt. Okay, Miami is tied for second with 8.1 yards per attempt. And then when it comes to the passing touchdowns, uh, Detroit is tied for ninth with 11 passing touchdowns. Obviously none over the last two weeks, so two games. Uh, Miami is tied for fifth with 12 passing touchdowns. So you have some ex- you have some you have some good offense here. Um, I don't think Miami runs the ball all that well, but they can rip off runs here and there. Um, their their game is predicated on uh, timing and rhythm and tempo passes to Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. And good luck when those dudes get the ball in their hand. Uh, it's just, they're just explosive. They're fast, uh, all of it. Okay, on to the defense. The Lions are the number 30 defense uh, against uh, against the run, yards per carry, allowing 5.3 yards a pop. Uh, Miami is tied for ninth, allowing 4.2 yards per carry. And then rushing touchdowns allowed. The Lions are, are number 31 in the NFL They've allowed 12. Miami's tied for 28th. They've allowed 8. So you can see, uh, you know, both teams have surrendered a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, touchdowns on the ground. Um, defense passing allowed. The, the, the Lions are number 31, allowing 7.7 yards per attempt. Miami is number 27, allowing 7.2 yards per attempt. And then passing touchdowns allowed. Uh, Detroit's tied for 18. They've allowed 9. And Miami's tied for 24. They, they've allowed 11. So uh, those are your stats kind of going into the week. Now, um, this is where we're going to talk a lot about this. The Lions are the worst uh, team in the NFL right now with nine total sacks generated. Uh, Miami's tied for 20th with 14 total sacks generated. Now, doesn't tell the whole story because sacks are, to me... I mean, sacks are great and all that stuff, but but I w- I would I'd be more interested in the number of pressures that each defensive line or each defense is generating. Um, I think that's more indicative of, of a pass rush and what and what teams are capable of doing. Um, you know, as far as being able to get the quarterback off of his spot to get him to either move or throw the ball sooner than he wants to. Um, obviously, we've seen what pressure does to a guy like Jared Goff. It's just, it's something we're going to have to confront and deal with, talk about. Um, but those that's kind of where your trend is. So, um, you know, when it comes to hurries, um, my assumption is, and I don't have these solid numbers, but um, I don't think the Lions are in, you know, in a good place with the number of hurries they have. And my guess is that Miami... Is in the, is in the middle of the pack in that range, so I don't again just like last week not as bad, but I just I don't think there's a scenario where the Lions are going to protect Goff to where he's super comfortable and has plenty of time and can just stand back there and pick a defense apart. I just don't think that that's I'm just not sure that's where we, where you know where the Lions are and where and what we should be thinking about from from the offense, but. So, um, the trend that I mentioned uh, earlier, this is the trend. I think this is something that we'll be able to follow through and, and will tell us the story of each matchup uh, going forward is, are teams able to make Jared Goff uncomfortable via pressure? Um, and if so, probably not looking like great things on offense that week if the lions are able to put the put themselves in a situation and this is where i hope that it is this week where they can run the ball effectively enough to not force goff to have to deal with pressure you know in the in passing situations or even to pick out you know uh passing situations that you like where the ball comes out quick you know that's the hope and that's that's really where we are um if a team, I just, I just simply put, if a team can stop the Lions from running the ball well, and have um, an adequate enough pass rush, the Lions' offense is going to suffer. 
Uh, the Lions' offense will look putrid at times. It will look confused. Uh, Goff will make bad throws. He will put the ball into dangerous places. Um, and then there's the fumble issue, too. So there's there's a lot of things, a lot of negative things happening around the storyline of if a team can force Goff to hang in the pocket, which which is something he's not even doing anyway. I keep saying that, but it's not what he's doing. Um, he's not staying in the pocket. What He's, he's leaving the pocket immediately. And um, sometimes going out the back door, uh, making it impossible, the angles at which his, his tackles have to have to block like you know in a perfect world you would want him climbing the pocket stepping up into a good pocket and making a throw but he's leaving the pocket so soon you know and a gen- just as a general rule a general idea that he's leaving the pocket so soon that that opportunity isn't there and therefore the pass rush that ends up getting home isn't is not at all a product of a failing play by either of the tackles. It's just that the angle in which Goff has drifted uh, too far deep and and made it too difficult for the tackles to block, um, he's just making their job so much harder. And I don't quite know how you fix that problem. This has been a career-long issue for Goff. And then uh, compounding that problem are is the... He's always, to me, he's always looked like a guy who needs to completely trust uh, his target to be exactly where they're supposed to be before he will throw the ball. And when Amon Ra went out last week, it looked like he lost all faith in um, wanting to throw the ball to certain players. It's just, it's frustrating. It was, <sighs> yeah. Okay, so enough about that. On offense. (laughs) So the Lions, it looks like the Lions are getting swift back. I think Amon Ra will play. Those are are great things for for their rhythm and tempo and timing. Uh, For the short passing game, for all the things that we think that the Lions are are able to do against a team like Miami. But, you know, the interesting thing in this matchup is the pace at which Miami is likely going to score in this game which is going to force the Lions to do the same. It's a little bit like if you if you remember back to the Philly game in week one where the Lions got down earlier, but early in the game, but but then had to open up things on offense for themselves, and they, they ended up keeping pace in that game. Same, same thing with Seattle. So, you know, um, it's not out of the realm of possibilities for, for the Lions to hang with Miami in this game, but to do so – they're going to need their offense to play a great game. So getting Swift back is huge. I mean, it's it's from a passing game standpoint, and not necessarily as a runner. But uh, getting the ball to him in, sc- in the screen game and just out in space where he is so effective um, and, and creating big chunk plays is great for the offense. Um, Amon Ra returning healthy, huge for the offense as far as being able to get the ball out quick. And getting and having Jared Goff be comfortable, not having to deal with pressure, and uh, we see, you see the jittery feet, you see him leave the pocket, you see him uh, push the ball into areas where a, you know a receiver is either double teamed or or just into a dangerous place where it just doesn't seem like he's playing good smart football. Um, and you know. Take this with a grain of salt. This is not easy stuff, and I'm not making, I'm not talking about his character or any of that stuff. This is super complicated, very difficult things to do. Um, it would take uh, just asking somebody to hang in the pocket, the, especially with the kind of pressure he was seeing last week, is asking too much of anybody. It just is. But there, but there, it doesn't mean that there weren't opportunities for them if he just. Hung in there quick, you know, enough to see those opportunities. But, but there were moments where he was, you know, shotgun snaps where he was catching the ball and and immediately vacating the pocket. So um, the hope is that we we're not in a situation where we're watching this play out where, you know, same stuff is is happening. So again, we wanna we wanna run the ball well and effectively. And keep them to where they can, you know, 
run, you know, long, a long uh, drive where you're taking some of the air out of the ball and not giving the ball back to Miami so they can score because it's kind of what's going to happen. You know, like how what are you doing on defense to stop Jalen Waddell and, and Tyreek Hill and Mike Gesicki and all these other weapons that they have? Um, the best way to do that is to not let them have the ball. So, you know, game plan from a game plan standpoint, and this is very sophomoric, um, but um, it does make sense, is to run the ball and to chew up as much clock as you can. Uh, and it would be great if the Lions could, could, you know, come out and on their first possession go for, you know, 70 yards and a touchdown and take off, you know, seven or eight minutes of time off the clock. That's a great thing. That's just one possession less, you know, that, that Miami's going to get. So, I mean, that's kind of where the offense is. Uh, I do think that, that you know, there are plays to be had against Miami, uh, against their defense. I think that, you know, that's that's where this will, this will uh, it's just going to be an interesting matchup is to see what pace uh, Miami's offense scores at and what the Lions' response to that is. So it's a very generic look at what the offensive matchup is going to be. The Lions do look to be getting a little healthier um, with some of their some of their weapons returning, and you know, um, it'll be interesting to see what happens at the trade deadline. I don't, I don't expect anything with the Lions, but but around the league, there's already been some things that have happened that are super interesting. Uh, you know. Um, the Lions have a decision to make about TJ Hawkinson. I'm not sure what they're going to do with that. The Lions have a decision to make with DeAndre Swift. I'm not sure what the, what they're going to do with that. Uh, and I'm not trying to stir up any controversy or any you know create any nonsense there. But you know, um, the Lions are in the middle of a very big rebuild. And do you pay? Do you pay tight end? You know. 13 14 15 million dollars a year for what he's given you through four years and you know my answer to that is an absolute no but i'm also not in a position to know exactly what's going on down there um and then you have to replace that right so it's just you know we'll see uh it would be you know i would love for the lions to move hawkinson for 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 good draft capital that'd be great um and I, I, it's not necessarily even about him as a player. It's just where they are in this rebuild. <clears throat> um, so I, I'm, distra- I'm distracted. Um, uh, it's been a day. Uh, so the, the offensive side of things is as simple as um, stay in the game. In order to do that, you might have to open up your offense. But I wouldn't say open up the offense and go five-step drop, seven-step drop, and have Jared Goff hang in, the, hang in, you know, in the pocket for five seconds and deal with pressure. No, I mean, quick passes, first downs, just more, you know, just lots of first downs, lots of play time chewed uh, through the through the Lions' ability to run the ball for first downs, and therefore kind of taking the air out of the ball and reducing the amount of possessions. Period that you're giving to the Dolphins because the Dolphins are going to score. So over to the defensive side of the ball. Okay, so um, Tua Tungavailoa has played very well, very well so far this year. The Miami Dolphins are a very different team with him as their quarterback. Jalen Waddell, I know Jamar Chase was in the same draft class, but he was my favorite receiver in uh, that draft class two years ago simply for the way he played. He was obviously very fast, super explosive, all that stuff. But hidden inside his game was was the ability to go up and win at the catch point, which, you know, most super fast receivers don't do things like that. So I had, I felt much more comfortable about his, about my evaluation on him um, just because he did some very physical things that other receivers wouldn't do, you know, dealing with contact and coming down with the ball, uh, being comfortable doing that kind of stuff. Like, you know, he's a dog. There's, 
I know he's like people consider him to be like this finesse weapon because he's so fast, but that's not that's not all his game is predicated on. He is a dog. Uh, Tyreek Hill is a freak. They both are together. I just I don't know what you do. Um, you know, maybe this is a this was the split safety kind of week for them where where you know you were able to potentially bracket one on one side of the field and you know do your best to double team um the other but you know this is going to be a tough matchup uh they're both elite electric weapons with the ball in their hands and then it's a matter of tackling well and and you know pursuing well tackling well running to the ball um some you know turnover luck that you might that you might get uh, we'll talk about pressure in a second because I think there was some hopeful stuff last week. So stay tuned. We're talking pressure in a second. I'm delusional. Um, there, uh, this is a tall task. I mean, this was you know we we talked last week about how difficult it was going to be to stop the Dallas offense, but this is a different animal. This is these you know Tua and and Hill. And uh, Waddle and Gasicki and the other and, and Mostert and Edmonds and all these other dudes, um, they're all explosive players. And Mike McDonald is a really good coach, and I would expect him to be able to take advantage of some of the things that the Lions have done on defense. And uh, you know, it's this is a rough matchup. It just is. Um, it's going to be super interesting to see how the Lions play this, though. Uh, Akuda was incredible last week. He was. It's 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 his best game, and and his recovery from the Achilles to this point is nothing less than incredible. It just is, and he looks the part. Um, I would say that asking him to to walk up to the line of scrimmage and press either of these guys might be a bit of a mistake, because once they release from the line of scrimmage, he's not catching back up. He's just not. So I think we'll see a little more zone. We'll see a little more bracketed stuff. Um, I'm guessing there. You know, I don't – that's what I would do, but that doesn't mean really much in the scheme of what they're going to do. There's so much – There's a. they're a lot smarter than – than. Uh, I mean, you know, there's, it doesn't matter what, I'll, what I'm thinking I would do. So um, – you know, obviously the Lions have to do a good job def- defending the run, which is uh, we're going to every week. I don't have to say it anymore. That's kind of like it, it's a given. But limiting uh, Hill and Waddle's big plays, getting off the field on third down is going to be huge in this game. Um, it's going to be tough to do it, and then to and then to get into position to get off the field and take the ball back, and then maybe you know, like we talked about earlier, grind some time off the clock. Uh, that's that's going to be where this game, if if the Lions are in it, it's because they've been able to get off the field on third down and then grind away at the clock running the ball. Uh, and then, you know, splash plays here and there. A big a big DeAndre Swift screen pass kind of thing. Um, a big run. Uh, maybe getting back on track because the Lions have looked very vanilla and very stale on offense the last two weeks. And I know that's personnel-related. Um you know they got to get their they got to get the Stella's got to get her groove back so to speak. Uh, so that's kind of where it is. It's a you know it's a, it's going to be a tough matchup um, for the Lions to hang on you know against what Miami does on offense. But you know um, in the end I do expect a bit of a high scoring game. I expect uh, a little bit like the Seattle game, a little bit like the Philly game where maybe Miami jumps out to a lead. And the Lions then open it up, like I said, not you know, not in a bad way for Goff, but just we have to throw, uh, we're throwing short passes, we're moving the chains, that kind of stuff, uh, and we're scoring touchdowns because Miami's, Miami's given up a bunch of touchdowns both on the ground and through the air. So uh, that's where it is. Um, I do think we are entering the meat of the schedule, which could be, uh, where we could have announced, we we might have an announcement here in a few weeks 
um, that draft season has arrived, which is a bummer, but um, it's draft season, so it's fun, and and there's a lot to talk about, and we'll have we'll be able to make more videos, and we'll be able to see each other more. So, you know, I think sometimes silver lining about things is good. Uh, I don't know if it's good for us to see each other more, though. <laughs> I'm still thinking about what I just said, and maybe that. Maybe that's not a great thing. Maybe it is. I don't know. Um, no, I, I, all kidding aside, it's this is a tough matchup. Um, we know we we kind of know what the Lions need to do on offense and defense to keep themselves in this game. Um, I don't expect. I'm not expecting great things from the Lions. I don't expect them to win this week. Um, I would love to see Josh Pascal continue. We got to talk about him for a minute. Okay, so he comes in, and the first snap he takes, it is very obvious that he is physically uh, prepared, capable, and um, can handle himself playing big boy football at this level. The heaviness in his hands is something to behold. It just is, and it translates. You saw it at Kentucky. Um, the ability for him to jolt these offensive linemen backwards and to 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 push push these guards and tackles into the lap of the quarterback is super impressive. Um, there is a rep that it, we've all seen it that Aiden Hutchinson takes and he tries to bull rush Tyler Smith, which that's a mistake. Tyler Smith is a huge, strong dude. And it's just a mistake for, for Hutchinson to take on a full man like he did there. Um, a few snaps later, they switch sides, and Pascal's on this side now. And he goes bull rush on Tyler Smith, and he rocks Tyler Smith backwards. And it's like, it's, it is noticeable the how heavy his hands are and his ability to move people. Um Super impressive in his first game. So the combo, the pairing of Pascal on the closed end side, uh, which is where Hutchinson had played on, up until this point, and that was some of the frustration about why they were just letting Hutchinson take on these double teams and just burying him inside when that's not necessarily the strength of his game. Well, Pascal showing up in week, in week uh, seven... I'm not great at the math. I think that was week seven last week. Um, for him to show up and look the way he did in the first half and to generate movement on the offensive line uh, and to create some pressures and to make some plays against the run was super impressive. And it's for a person like me who watches it the way I do, I, it was awesome. It was awesome to watch. But then looking at how that the, the correlation there uh, of Hutchinson getting kicked out to the other side and at times being able to stand him up and let him rush. Um, he had two sacks in the game. Uh, everybody's been screaming about wanting him to, to, to see him beat you know somebody one on one. He did twice. Um, he had a he had a really good game. So you know as I know that they're they're the last they're last in the NFL with nine sacks, but I think that that's potentially changing. Uh, between those two, and it's just super interesting to see uh, that play out in one week. The the thought process be, uh, process behind, all right, we take Hutchinson at two, and we take Pascal at 46, and he's a total steal there, like a total steal. And to, and to see how that, the pairing, um, how they play off one another, it's just, it's going to, you know, I think there's good stuff ahead. Um I know there's plenty to be disappointed about and to be bummed out and uh, about, and I know that nobody feels good about being a Lions fan right now. But I, to me, it just it's still I haven't lost the feeling that this does feel different. Um, they do have they do have game changing players. They just don't have enough of them. And then there's stuff there's stuff on the way. Jamison Williams is still on the way. And I know I talked last week about being a little bit bummed that he wasn't quite ready. And it sounds like it's going to be at least four more weeks before 
he sh- he comes back um, to play in his first NFL game, which makes me even more bummed. Like it's just taken a long time, but but it's not outside the guidelines of what an ACL recovery is. And I'm not it's I'm not holding it against them. There's no reason for them to be playing him right now if he's not 100% ready to roll. Um, in fact, I would say it'd be stupid to be playing him right now. Um, given, you know, the idea is for him to be a huge piece of their future going forward. So um, it's just kind of a state of, uh, of where they are. Um, I know nobody wants to start talking about the draft. We're not going to do any of that stuff. But, yeah, but, but you know, that's where, that's where this matchup is. Uh, very tough matchup. Very tough matchup on defense. Um, we'll see how the Lions choose to deploy, uh, you know, their defenders to stop Hill and Waddle. Um, I almost don't think it matters so much because they're so good. You know, we'll see how it goes. But um, the Lions could, they have a chance to be reasonably effective and productive on offense um, especially in in uh, in a game in which I believe they're going to be chasing from behind, and uh, like I've mentioned, like this Seattle Philly game kind of stuff like that. So that's the that's the preview for Miami at home this week in Week Eight. Um, any questions? Any comments? Um, especially if they're positive comments, we love those. Um, now, if there's any questions or uh, thoughts. Um, on other videos that you guys want made or talked or uh, topics to talk about, we could do. I mean, if you guys want to do a mailbag kind of a thing where you ask some questions, I'll answer qu- whatever. It's good. Um, let me know. Uh, you can let Chris know. Um, there's the Slack channel, all that stuff. So, so that's where it is for week eight. Uh, you guys have a great weekend. Hopefully, uh, there's good things and fun things for us to see in store. See ya.